This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, home to thousands of nonfiction documentaries from some of the best filmmakers in the world. Follow the link below to start your free trial today. If you're tired of seeing feel-good commercials about these uncertain times and Home Depot won't stop emailing you about what they're doing to help prevent COVID, you're not alone. It gets old after a while. It's especially strange to see the world spiral into dysfunction while every online advertisement is peppier and more saccharine than ever. We get it, big companies need to pivot to new business models to keep their numbers up while people are holed up inside. But besides trying to ignore sickly sweet Hulu ads, what most of us are doing is wondering, when will the world be safe again? In this episode, we're going to look at historical precedents for pandemic recovery and try to come up with a rough estimate of when the outside world will feel more normal. As a disclaimer, we won't be talking about any of the debate over reopening various countries for the sake of the economy, or the various astroturfed protests happening in America. Those are important topics, but this video will strictly be about historical precedents. Before we begin, the terms COVID-19 and coronavirus refer to the disease itself, while SARS-CoV-2 refers to the virus that causes the disease. To avoid unnecessary confusion regarding SARS and COVID, the World Health Organization has taken to referring to the virus as COVID-19, or the virus responsible for COVID-19. In this episode, the terms coronavirus and COVID-19 will be used interchangeably for both the virus and the disease. Now, we'll start by looking at the current numbers for COVID-19. As another disclaimer, we're still very much in the throes of this pandemic. These numbers will change quickly. And by the time this video is uploaded, they'll already be out of date. This data was gathered on May 4th, 2020. Updated information will be available in the description below. As of writing this script, there have been a total of more than 3.6 million reported cases of coronavirus. It's worth noting that these are the official reported cases. The actual number is likely much higher. Of those infected, over 250,000 have died and just shy of 1.2 million have recovered. One month ago, on April 4th, the world had reported just over 1.2 million cases. That means the global number of cases has tripled in a single month. As of May 4th, the United States has the most cases of coronavirus, with 1.2 million confirmed, followed by Spain with 248,000 cases, then Italy with 212,000, and the UK with 192,000. According to the New York Times, the US government projects daily coronavirus deaths in the country will nearly double by June 1st. You can follow various live trackers online, two of which are linked in the description below. Looking at these numbers, it's clear that we're still very much in the middle of this pandemic especially if cases in the U.S. grow as projected and we're unable to contain the spread. But how does this compare to past pandemics? We'll start with the obvious historical comparison, the 1918 Spanish flu outbreak. Named not for its place of origin, but for the fact that Spain allowed free reporting on the disease, which led to the association. In 1918, the world was embroiled in one of the greatest conflicts in human history, which would later become known as World War I. The global mass mobilization of troops and overcrowding in military camps contributed greatly to the spread of a particularly deadly strain of influenza. Throughout March of that year, outbreaks of flu-like symptoms were reported in the U.S. It started to get noticed when over 100 soldiers at a military camp in Kansas contracted the illness. Within a week, that number had quintupled. The first public health report came on April 5, 1918. The report stated that there had been 18 severe cases and three deaths in Haskell, Kansas. In the following weeks, infected soldiers shipped off to France to fight in the war. Unfortunately for the US, the disease had already found a foothold in the country. And thanks to a recent piece of legislation called the Sedition Act, which criminalized the publishing of any information that might hinder the war effort, the people of the United States had little idea of what was headed their way. Newspapers shot down the advice of the country's medical experts, downplayed the danger, and the number of cases exploded. In Philadelphia alone, 14,500 people were killed by the Spanish flu, necessitating mass graves. Over the course of the next year, the Spanish flu pandemic infected over a third of the world's population and killed over 50 million people, 675,000 in the U.S. alone. The world had experienced three waves of outbreak, a mild one in early 1918, then a mutated, far deadlier one in the fall that could kill a perfectly healthy 20-year-old in under 24 hours. Then finally, one last wave in the spring of 1919 that fell somewhere between the two, worse than the first wave, but not nearly as severe as the second. We hear a lot in the news today about social distancing and flattening the curve, which means keeping the number of new cases below the capacity of the healthcare system. While the people of the early 1900s may not have used the same terminology, they did employ many of the same measures we're taking today. Many cities recommended wearing masks. They closed schools and prohibited large public gatherings. Of course, there were some cities that chose not to take these measures and suffered greater outbreaks than those that did. But overall, the 1918 social distancing plan worked, at least at first. As the number of new cases began to decline, these preventative measures were lifted to help ease the strain on the struggling economy. Unfortunately, the disease was still very much a threat. 
and the newly relaxed restrictions caused that third wave you see in the chart. The Spanish flu really represents the perfect storm for a pandemic. Global war and mass exposure to infected people, a lack of understanding of viruses, which wouldn't actually be discovered for a few more years, and a suppression of the reality of the danger. All of these factors, combined with the fact that the Spanish flu was incredibly deadly, worked together to create the worst pandemic the modern world had seen. A lot has changed since 1918. We have a much greater understanding of viruses and how they work, our medical treatments are more advanced, and, in theory, it's easier to get more accurate and timely information during a crisis. If that's the case, we should expect more recent pandemics to have been less severe. Let's take a look at the remaining few that occurred between 1918 and today. In more recent decades, we've seen the Asian flu in 1957-58, the Hong Kong flu from 68-70, to SARS from 2002-2003, to swine flu from 2009-2010, to Ebola from 2014-2016, to and now COVID-19 beginning in late 2019. As you can see, coronavirus is already much deadlier than most of the recent pandemics. The notable exceptions are the Asian flu and Hong Kong flu, the two oldest on the list. Part of the reason for this is each disease's R0, or how infectious they are. COVID-19 has an R0 of 2.5, meaning each infected person will likely infect two and a half other people in the area. By comparison, some diseases such as measles have an R0 of 16. But this infectiousness rating isn't the only factor. After all, SARS had a rating of 3.5, and the death toll only reached 770 people. Why has coronavirus spread so much more rapidly? Part of the reason is the long incubation period of COVID-19. On average, infected people don't start to show symptoms for two weeks, and some never show any symptoms at all, despite being contagious the entire time. SARS had an incubation period of just seven days, so it became apparent you were sick much more quickly and you could take steps to prevent infecting other people. These are the main factors contributing to the unchecked spread of coronavirus. Despite SARS having a mortality rate of almost 10% compared to COVID-19's tentative 3.5 to 5%, COVID-19 has killed far more people simply because it spreads long before people realize they're infected. Ebola is a similar story. It had a mortality rate of upwards of 50%, but infected people looked very sick and disease transmission required direct contact with infected bodily fluids. That doesn't seem to be the case with coronavirus. One thing that all of these outbreaks have in common is their duration. They all lasted at least one year, with SARS, swine flu, and Ebola all lasting closer to two years or longer. Interestingly, the Spanish flu, Asian flu, and Hong Kong flu all consisted of multiple waves of infection, with the second deadlier than the first, whereas the more recent outbreaks have mostly consisted of a single, drawn-out period of infection. Based on what we've seen from COVID-19 so far, it looks like we're probably on track for a one-year ordeal. We've seen that when cities relax their social distancing guidelines, cases in that area spike again. With the U.S. weighing whether to open back up with the disease still very present, we'll likely see another major wave in the fall. Some experts suggest it might last even longer, up to two years or more, depending on how effective containment measures are. But a single one to two year pandemic is only one of the potential scenarios. Another possibility is the coronavirus going from pandemic to endemic. That is, becoming a seasonal illness that we have to deal with forever. Humans already have three endemic seasonal strains of influenza, and there are other diseases like tuberculosis that have also become endemic. There's really no way to say for certain whether COVID-19 will go the way of SARS and Ebola, or become an unwelcome addition to our annual illness list. If it does become endemic, we'll hopefully be able to rely on an effective vaccine to keep ourselves safe, which most experts think will be available within a year or so. So, while we're all going a little stir-crazy, do your best to stay safe and not interact with other people unnecessarily. We still have a ways to go before we're done with coronavirus. If you'd like to learn more about the coronavirus and the confusion and chaos surrounding its spread and origin, I highly recommend you watch The Coronavirus Epidemic on CuriosityStream. It's a fascinating look at how the world responds to a rapidly spreading virus and the measures we can take to stem the tide of infection. If you watch my videos, you'll know I'm a big fan of CuriosityStream. It's an online streaming service with thousands of nonfiction titles from some of the best filmmakers in the game. You can find tons of great episodes like The Coronavirus Epidemic, and they've got a bunch of material on technology and outer space, which are some of my favorites. Their giant catalog includes content on science, nature, astronomy, technology, and lifestyle, among others. Unlimited access starts at just $2.99 a month, and as a special offer just for you guys, you can get a free trial by following the link below. CuriosityStream is available on just about every platform you can imagine, so wherever you are, you'll always have access to great, interesting content. As an added bonus, your CuriosityStream subscription now comes with a free Nebula subscription. 
Nebula is a new streaming platform built by and for creators like Wendover Productions, Real Engineering, Kurtzkazakt, and of course, Second Thought and many others. It's a place for us to try new things and make original content that just wouldn't be possible on YouTube. Give CuriosityStream a shot and get free access to Nebula when you visit curiositystream.com slash secondthought. If you enjoyed this episode, consider dropping a like. If not, a thumbs down. While you're here, check out some of my other work. I have videos on all sorts of topics, and I bet you'll find something you'll enjoy. Remember to subscribe if you'd like to see more episodes like this one, and click the bell to be notified each time I upload a new video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.